Hi folks, welcome to Living Waters Church. We are in December and we want to remember together that Christmas is about generosity. There's so much going on in the life of our church. Today's a special day because we're gonna talk especially about ways we are being generous even with our finances as a local church. In a couple of moments, we're gonna hear from our treasurer, Dave and Mike are also gonna share more on how we are giving as a community at the end of the year. Before that though, just a couple of things going on in the life of our church. First of all, a reminder that Alpha is coming in the new year and our question is who can we invite? There's an opportunity in Alpha for people to discuss life, faith, meaning, God, and a safe, hospitable environment. And we would love to see this place filled with people having those kinds of conversations. So consider who you can invite uh, into Alpha coming into the new year or consider how you might serve in Alpha. There's so many ways to help lift that wonderful opportunity we have coming in 2024. Also a reminder that Helping Hands is still underway. Dozens and dozens of people serving across Langley and the surrounding areas, making a difference in our neighborhood. Connect with Helping Hands through our website. There are still opportunities to get involved. A couple other things going on in the life of our church. There's great things happening throughout Sundays in December. We invite you into those, especially on Christmas Eve. You can find all of our information there. The Christmas Eve times are available for you to make your plans on Christmas Eve. You're gonna wanna be here. It's gonna be great. Our young adults are getting together soon for their Christmas party at the table. We invite you into that. We also wanna let you know that there is a new opportunity to work at Living Waters Church. If you're interested in a kids ministry assistant position, we invite you to take a look at our website and get connected to that. Finally, as you can see in my hand, I'm holding a Christmas card. For many years, we have put together Fort Langley Christmas cards, and yet again, we've done that now. We have a picture here taken by our very own Rob Wilson last year of the frozen Fraser River, a wonderful message of uh, holiday blessing and love to our community, as well as information about the life of the church and Christmas Eve on the back. If you would like to help hand one of these cards out, come by the church this week. You can pick one up and take it to a local business or organization. We'd love uh, to share and to give in that way together. On that topic now, here's our treasurer to share about giving and a bit of a financial picture in the life of the church. Thanks for joining us. I can't believe it's December already, and I know I'm not the first to have said that. December is obviously a full and important month in the church calendar with Christmas just around the corner. But just like that, it's gonna be January. May you and your family find peace and joy in this Christmas season. You're gonna hear some news today about generosity from Dave and Mike, how we as a church are able to once again bless some local and global organizations financially at what can be a very challenging time of the year. But this generosity doesn't start with the church or even you and I, it starts with God. I'm reminded of time about 10 years ago, sitting around a table discussing church finances and being overwhelmed by what God was doing through his people at the end of the year. It was a time of abundance. We had planned the church's generosity giving, but more had come in, more than we could have hoped or imagined for. A friend of mine at the table turned to me and said, it just goes to show you, you can't outgive God. He wasn't just talking about finances, he was also referring to the love, grace, and mercy of God. I'll never forget that moment and the conversation and prayers that followed. Prayers of gratitude and thankfulness for God's provision through his people, through you and I. There's a responsibility that comes with that provision. Good stewardship is key. And I hope that the measures we have in place here at the church give you confidence when you give. Our processes and procedures for handling donations are sound, and we're particularly aware of these responsibilities at this time of the year, a season when abundance is not always evident in everyone's life. Thank you as you continue to give on a regular basis, or maybe you're considering a one-off donation. Please know that whatever and whenever you give makes a difference. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, David has been our treasurer for many years, and we're so greatly appreciate his diligence as he serves on our council and oversees our finances. As a church, we have five values, and within these values, you'll read words like local and global neighborhoods, 
and sharing with many people and places. Why? Because we want to be as a community active in caring for and supporting good work that's happening within our neighborhoods. Work perhaps that would make Jesus smile. We've made a practice at Living Waters Church to set aside 5% of everything that's given to our general fund. We've set it aside and we call it our generosity fund. And you can imagine over the course of a year, this fund grows to the point of us being very curious and interested in supporting and coming alongside groups and activities and people that are serving within our community and wanting to help them financially. As a church, we've been doing this for many, many years, even to the point of recognizing that in the last 10 years, we've given upwards to $800,000 uh, to local work. Thank you for your generosity. Yeah, our local work team and our, our ministry team, they do some work behind the scenes and they come in and, and share with council ways that we can give. So this December, we get to give uh, in a few different ways. The first way is we get to give $45,000 to eight local organizations. They focus on caring for the poor, uh, those without homes, widows, the vulnerable, uh, the orphan, the prisoner. Th these organizations are serving Langley and our surrounding areas in such a beautiful way. Uh, let me read them to you. Uh, the Boys and Girls Club of Langley, the gateway of hope, a, a long history we've had with them as Langley's only homeless shelter. Inclusion, Langley Child Development Center. They support children and adults with developmental and intellectual needs. Uh, we're giving to the Langley Food Bank. And of course, especially in this economic climate, we need to support uh, our local food bank. We're also gonna be hosting a food drive later this month in our, our movie night. We're giving to the Langley Seniors Resource Center towards the many programs and services they offer to seniors in Langley. We're gonna be giving to uh, Wagner Hills and giving to uh, Young Life Capernaum, which uh, serves youth with disabilities. So sponsoring families to attend summer camps. We're giving $6,000 to each of these organizations. We're also gonna be giving $3,000 uh, to our local women's prison, the ministry that's been happening there over the past couple uh, years. We're gonna be giving gift baskets and personalized cards for them. Uh, how incredible that we get to serve in that way. What other ways uh, are we giving? Yeah, I'm excited to uh, be able to share up $20,000 being given to two ministries that uh, serve so well and their needs have become close to our heart. Uh, specifically Community Life Church in Port Alberni, uh, now a seven-year-old church plant, and who over the course of this of last year have taken some beautiful steps of faith and priorities to serve next gen, to serve kids and youth. And so our support to them will go to help them uh, move towards the end of the year and be in a, in a positive financial position. Secondly, University Christian Ministries, serving students at SFU, BCIT, and the University of Fraser Valley. We're grateful uh, to have Joanna Skukas now, one of our new global workers who recently shared about ministries on uh, BCIT. And, and finally, um, our global workers, what a joy to be able to give to them. And thank you so much for your generosity, uh, for, for us being able to give uh, a year-end gift beyond our regular monthly support, a gift to our global workers, uh, totaling a, a amount of $10,000. On our website, we've said so much. <laughs> On our website, uh, you can find this information about uh, these various organizations, ministries, and people. And uh, again, more about the global workers who were uh, serving alongside. So again, thank you so much for your generosity. So why are we sharing this? Well, we want to be a church that models the generosity of Jesus. Locally, globally, even as we meet together, we want to be a giving church. And we know that that goes beyond finances. The needs in our neighborhood are great. The needs in Port Alberni, our university campuses, even in the neighborhoods of our global workers, they're great. Uh, and we are grateful that we can pour out in, in the way we can. Uh, so as been said, thank you. Your generosity comes in many ways, shapes and forms, and we're grateful that we can do this together. 
Let's uh, take a moment. Uh, we've listed so many and uh, organizations and groups that represent people that are helping people. And uh, let's take a moment uh, to pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for our community. Uh, we thank you for those that serve um, in our area, uh, large-hearted, caring people that are often serving in sacrificial ways. And uh, we pray um, that uh, the gifts that we've mentioned, which will be given, um, we pray that they be received in the spirit in which they're given. A spirit of thankfulness, a spirit of appreciation, a spirit of just uh, well-being and blessing upon uh, our community and the people that are helping other people. Lord, thank you. You've been so good to us as a local church this past year. We thank you for your generosity. And at this time of year, us being able to recognize how good you've been uh, we, we commit our, our lives to you, our ways to you. Uh, we pray as we move along in this month of December that you continue to help us be mindful of the needs of others around us. Help us to be generous uh, as we receive of your generosity and be reminded of that this time of year. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Well, this is the first Sunday of Advent. And our prayers include God, Give us hope. We will hear now a story from someone within our community that has carried in their lives unanswered prayer, has navigated a number of unexpected events, and has found hope during times when it has seemed her future was uncertain. My name is Joy Kootenai. I'm married and I have uh, five kids. Um, my oldest just turned 30. So yeah, and then they go down from there. And uh, we started coming to Living Waters Church about 10 years ago when we moved in from, from Richmond. My husband and I met in Bible College, kind of cliche, but uh, we, we, had, um, we wanted to go to ministry, be global workers, and uh, we started um, you know, on this journey, and then we, we, we discovered we were gonna have a child. You know, just before we had this baby, somebody came up to me and said, you know, if you're, if you're serving Jesus, if you love Jesus, you're gonna have perfect children. And it just sort of jarred me. I thought, oh, what does that mean? <laughs> like, what, 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 do I, what are my expectations of God and, and my life? They got me on a little journey. And it was, it was interesting because later, my child was actually born with disabilities. He had a cleft lip and palate and, and um, autism and mental handicap. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden I was, I was grappling with this God, what did I expect out of you? And and what's what's the purpose of of somebody um, being born like this? And and you know you're looking for meaning in it. You know, the journey of having um, something unexpected happen in your family um, was new to our whole family. You know, it's not just it's just not just us as parents, but our you know there's aunties and uncles and grandparents and what they expected too. There was a lot of prayer initially for my second child who was born with the same kind of disabilities as the, as the first one, cleft lip and palate and mental handicap and all that. I, uh, we, we knew that this was coming and uh, there was a lot of prayer, you know, like, God, you can heal, you can, you can, you can do something different. <sighs> Even in that, I felt a little check, like, doesn't God know what he's doing? I think God knows what's best, you know? And, and there is, there's so much beauty in each unique person that he makes. Um, he doesn't make mistakes. There's no, there's no like, oh, whoops, that one came, came out wrong. Like, there's no such thing as that. Every, every child, every person is uniquely made and they have their own giftings for, for the, the life that they're gonna lead. They're, they're gifted. Um, they bless us in, in ways that we can't imagine. You know, we have a, kind of a linear idea of what our future is gonna be like. We think we know what's kind of best and what we expected. I think sometimes our linear idea of what what life's going to look like is is really limited and quite small compared to what God actually wants to do in our lives and through the journeys that our kids are going to have. Because it's not just about me; it's about my kids' journeys. Like each of them are uniquely made, and they're interacting with the world that God put them in, and they've got a place in it too. I can't live their life for them. What I have found to be my greatest hope is that. God will make things right. Things aren't going to be right in this world. You know, the Bible says, and you know, Jesus actually said it himself, he said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. 
I've overcome. And, and we're with Jesus. He, we're overcomers with him. So he, he's, he makes meaning out of, out of the hardest things in our life. And if we know anything about Jesus is that he, he's redemptive. And I mean, that's a really big word to, to pack in here, but redemption, he means he, he, he makes good out of something. He, he buys it back. You know, he, he makes good out of the hard things in life. One of the things that's helped me is to, to focus on what is good and what's true. And, and that's, there's a passage in, in Philippians that talks about that. But w- when we think about the things that are good and true and beautiful and right and make that our anthem, all of a sudden, all the, the negative things, they, it starts to sort of fade away. You know, we're not defined by, by the hardships in our lives, but we're defined by God's grace in it all. And God never leaves you. He never forsakes you. That, that's a promise. All the way through the Bible, you're gonna see that God does not leave you or forsake you. So you're, you're not alone. There is beauty and hope and goodness all around you if you, eyes, if you have eyes to see it. And our, our response then is worship and the work you do and, and the things that you have to do that are difficult. You do them as worship to God. And wow, that has got me through so many things because how am I gonna do that? I'm gonna do that well, I mean, like my work is, is worship. So how am I going to do that? I'm not going to do that with a bad attitude. I'm not going to do that feeling miserable and sorry for myself. I'm going to do that like as a fragrance to God, as a way of honoring God. What comes to the forefront of your mind as you think about the biblical Christmas story? Well, well perhaps what comes to your mind is, is kind of the what happened at Christmas, um, Bethlehem, some 2,000 years ago, right? The, the, the what? The baby, Mary and Joseph, the shepherds, the wise men, all the things you see on Christmas postcards and perhaps lawn ornaments this kind of year. I, I call these the, the what of Christmas. When answering, few consider the why of Christmas. Why a baby? Why was good news needed to be spoken over the world? Well, why? Christmas is about a living and loving God needing to come to tell everybody that things are not okay in the world. Christmas is about needing to shine. For, need, Christmas is about God needing to shine his clear, bright light into the darkness of our world, a light that shines upon much despair in many people's lives. Christmas is about God needing to light a lamp in this darkness and again shedding light on a much needed new way of love, life, and living. Why Christmas? Simply stated, God is taking the lead, saying things are not good, things need to change, things can change. Well, what about the how of Christmas? How did this come to pass? At the appointed time when things were dark and discouraging, God became flesh so he could come to the world to remake the world. And so the hope of Christmas is that the world that was made by him can now also be remade by him. The what? the why and the how of Christmas. We see that in the first Christmas, as noted in the Bible. And and as we review this Christmas story, we read that that big announcement at Christmas begins with where people were at. The message was, fear not. Addressing this fear is the why of Christmas. Christmas being a reminder that God saw a world that was full of fear, people suffering because of circumstances in their lives and all broken relationships that they found themselves in. I wonder if angels were to appear this Christmas, 2023, with one message. Perhaps the message would be the same as that very first message, fear not. We perhaps can all imagine how well received this would be based on the things that we know happening in the world today. Hearing a message to fear not 
may be very well received for it's much needed. For example, a, a message of fear not being heard by a family living in poverty, even in some parts of the world without clean water. A message of fear not being heard by a father on the front line of a battlefield today, many miles from home. A fear not being heard by an orphan in a foster home or an orphanage who has no belongings of their own. A message of fear not to someone who is a prisoner of war today with no one advocating. And of course, so many other needs in the world where a message of fear not would be warmly received. Fear not. We should remind ourselves that this was never God's plan. What do I mean? It was never God's plan to ever have to say fear not. We, we are so far from our human beginning in the Garden of Eden. Yet, decisions and choices mankind have made and continue to make lead along a path that creates tremendous vulnerability. And so the message of fear not is not now a necessary message. In the first Christmas story, recorded in Luke 1 and Matthew 1, who was afraid? Well, the simple answer is, most everyone. Fear played a significant role in the lives of each of the main characters, the, the who of Christmas, or the what of Christmas, Zachariah, Mary, and Joseph, whose lives were in full trepidation, doubt, and uncertainty, and in much needed, and a much need of hearing a fear not message. That is why the angels began, when they visited these three individuals, began with this proclamation or announcement, do not be afraid. While we cannot fully comprehend the men and women's fears that first Christmas, we can relate to perhaps why they feared. For we read about fear from unanswered prayer, fear from unexpected events, and fear from an uncertain future. Let's talk about them. The fear of Zechariah arises because of a fear of unanswered prayer. What danger did he feel? He felt forgotten. Luke 1, 13, But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Again, what danger did he feel? He felt neglected what was going on. Zechariah was a priest whose wife's name was Elizabeth. They are a much older couple, righteous and childless. And Zechariah and Elizabeth had prayed fervently for years for a child, but had, been, but had given up hope as their years passed. And so in Luke 1, we read how Zechariah was faithfully going about his ordinary priestly responsibilities, and an extraordinary event happens when he is chosen to enter, enter the temple and offer incense offering. So while fulfilling his duty, he receives a declaration from an angel of the Lord telling him that he and Elizabeth would bear a son. And later in Luke chapter 1, their son, whom they named John the Baptist, is born. The fear of unanswered prayer. Some of our greatest fears center around unanswered prayer. We pray for God to restore a relationship. We pray for freedom from addiction, suffering, and pain. We pray for the salvation of a spouse or a child, loved one. We pray for mental, emotional, and physical healing. We pray for the needs represented today in war and conflict. We pray for change in our land. It sure is easy to lose hope when our prayers seem to go nowhere especially unanswered prayers for a long time. And when you feel neglected by God, as Zechariah did, it can become a very dark time. When God seems to be withholding and resisting, when God seems to be this kind of no-show, after years of praying, it's faithfully praying, it's easy to get discouraged, to be fearful if things don't change. As we move along with unanswered prayer, there's, there's typically four responses. Number one, we turn inward. 
What's wrong with me? We think that maybe our prayers are hitting a ceiling and not reaching God's. We ask ourselves if we lack faith or if obedience is part of our character. We turn inward. We turn upward. What's wrong with God? Or even worse, does God hear our prayers yet refuses to answer? Can lead to huge amounts of resentment and bitterness. And sometimes we turn downward in the sense that we stop praying or even change our prayers. But what if there's nothing wrong with me? And what if there's nothing wrong with God? And what if the need is to keep praying, as the Bible says, praying without ceasing? Perhaps the prayer, appropriate prayer, on this first Sunday of Advent is to say, God, give me hope. Give me hope as I live with unanswered prayers. Zachariah of fear arose because he felt forgotten, but he wasn't. And nor are you. And certainly at this time of year, prayers are, are in front of us. Second Peter chapter 3, 9 reminds us in those waiting periods to be a trusting person. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand loneliness. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16, we're encouraged by the activity of rejoicing always, praying continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So we fear not. And we are asked by Scripture to remember that God is with us and that we are to keep praying and that we're not forgotten by God. He's with us. He's near to us. So fear not if you have unanswered prayers today. Secondly, the fear of Mary arises because of an unexpected event. Luke chapter 1, verse 26 to 34. What, what danger did Mary feel? She felt forsaken. Zechariah felt for God and she felt forsaken. Luke 1, 30, the angel, don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. She felt forsaken. God says, you have my favor. When the angel appears to a young, humble teenager, the Bible tells us that Mary was confused, shaken, disturbed, troubled, and concerned. Forsaken. I mean, what God unexpectedly asked Mary to do will change her life forever. Again, remember, this is a young, engaged virgin in love with the possible dreams of a wedding, a home of her own, and children. And God breaks into this scene and asks her to do the unimaginable, which is trust him with the impossible. What an unexpected event that created the trajectory of a, of, a, of a new way and a new day. Perhaps this year has brought to you many unexpected things. Many unexpected things have happened in your life. Life moving in one way, and now it's not. To which you would say, perhaps, I never saw it coming. And if you're honest, would say, I, it wouldn't be how I would write the script. While Mary was forsaken, her feelings were real, her fear was real, but her faith drew up some real truths about who God was and how God was watching over her life for good and for not for evil. And perhaps, friends, some of you need to hear that message as well today that you're not forsaken, you're not forgotten, that God is with you and his plans for you, perhaps unknown at this point, are for good and not for evil. So Mary, she, she overcomes her fear with acceptance. Accepting that she knew a good God was in control of her life and destiny and that God would make a way for her at the appropriate time. We are to fear not and accept what will come as we allow God to leave our lead our lives. Deuteronomy 31, 6 says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. 
Perhaps that's a message for someone today. Fear not. On this first Sunday of Advent, receive hope. Life, yes, will be full of many unexpected events, but God is with you. God is with you. Thirdly, the fear of Joseph arises because of an unknown future. Matthew 1, verses 18 to 21. Well, what danger did Joseph feel? He felt betrayal. John 1, 20, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Joseph, engaged to be married, to engage to Mary, and chosen to be the earthly father of Jesus, faced great fear in this Christmas story. When Joseph hears that his fiancée is pregnant, he's unsure what to think. You can imagine. He is an honorable man who wants to do the right thing, but Mary's story seems so unbelievable. Joseph is well-respected, so he fears how his family and friends will respond, yet he loves Mary and wants to be with her. He is considering ending the marriage altogether until the angel appears to him and speaks directly to what is bothering him. Fear not, Joseph. You're not forsaken. Joseph struggles with questions about an unknown future, as many of us do today. Perhaps more than ever before, we're living in a world that's full of uncertainty. Every day we seem to hear unwanted news that puts our plans on hold, threatens our health and security, and causes us to think very differently about the future, unexpected future. We can allow this fear of the unknown to cripple and paralyze us, or we can ask God for our hope. Joseph overcame fear by way of simple obedience. Joseph listened to the angel who brought him a, a direct message from God, and he obeyed, not knowing the consequence of his decision. He did not fully understand, could not see the whole picture, and he doubted his next move. But he did what the angel told him to do, he did the next right thing by marrying Mary. Just like Joseph, God often asks us to walk unknown paths into an unknown future, giving us only enough light to guide the next right step. We can be confident in the God that is not forsaken and is leading us Sometimes just one small step at a time. The big message of Christmas is fear not. Fear that arises from unanswered prayer, from unexpected events, and fear that arises from an uncertain future. It was, again, never God's original plan to have his people experience fear as they live in a world that he has made. But you and I do. We live in a world that on any given day is full of events and activities and things that strike fear in our hearts and minds, often with very little notice. That is why we need Christmas. Not just appreciating the what of the historical event, but the why and the how of Christmas. Psalm 34 says, I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and he delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. May I encourage you this Christmas. Christmas is about allowing God to see your need, to name your need, perhaps, and come to deliver you in the midst of your need. So as we begin this Advent season, may I encourage you to welcome him, be honest, make room for him, fear not, fear not. And I'm confident that you won't be disappointed, for Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, up close and personal getting involved in our lives such as they are. Let's pray.
Father, today we thank you for the message of Christmas that the world needs to hear again this year and that we need to hear again this year. We thank you that Christmas reminds us that in this world, things are not as they should be. And you've come to change things. And Lord, we would pray today for ourselves. We pray that change would begin within our lives as necessary. Remove fear, remove doubt, and may you fill our lives with hope this very day and this very season. Your word describes people that have hope, have faces and expressions that radiate the life and love of Jesus. And we would pray through the changing of our hearts that our faces, even this very day, would be radiant as dearly loved children. We love you, Jesus. We love you so much. Amen and amen. Again, uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, during Church Connect, has been shared throughout this uh, out this recording. There are so many things happening at Living Waters Church. We are so thankful to be able to uh, connect with you uh, this way. We'd be so thankful to be able to meet you in person at some time this week and month. God bless you. Have a have a wonderful uh, week. Go in with God's peace in your life. <music>